most of the research is in uh, materials, solid state physics. The materials we are studying is uh, essentially non-crystalline materials, new kind of non-crystalline materials, not in the way we have it today in terms of frozen in liquids, but rather than uh, structures which are made up by new atomic arrangements which we discovered by accident which turned out uh, to be have new properties. And very, very uh, theoretical aspects, practical aspects as well as new ways of preparing it. Again, the emphasis on new questions, new problems, but not repeating old things which we did before. Crystalline materials which are called nanoglasses, but as you will see, they're not glasses, it's a new solid state structure, uh, actually the equilibrium of disordered solid. And the attractive feature of that, uh, of this group of materials is that they seem to point out the way to new type of solids with new structures and uh, promising new applications. In order to show that, I'll divide my talk in uh, two parts. I will first say a few words about the background of today's technology and then talk about the new developments uh, which seem to point out the way to this new technology ranging from medical applications all the way to technology applications. Uh, if you look at today's, techno today's technologies, you will easily recognize that there is a very strong preference for crystalline materials, metal semiconductors, uh, ceramic materials. And the reason for that is very simple, because we can manipulate their properties by controlling their defect structure and by controlling their uh, chemical microstructure. Uh, two examples are shown over there. Uh, uh, here on the lower left side, uh, a defect, uh, defect microstructure in a palladium crystal. Here we have grain boundaries, and inside of these boundaries, at at atoms are arranged differently from the crystals next to it. Similarly, here chemical defects, <coughs> crystals, uh, iron and silver crystals next to each other, and these interfaces also causes changes. Here, for example, these grain boundaries are very traumatic changes, diffusivity changes by 20, 30 orders of magnitude. This is about the growth rate of a tree to the speed of a car. And uh, in glass, the situation is very different. In a glass, uh, the situation is such that we have a, 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 a here I show you a two-dimensional silicon dioxide glass, a high-resolution micrograph. You have a random arrangement of silicon and oxygen atom, but we cannot introduce defects similar to the ones over there or the ones over there. And this is a reason why we cannot manipulate grasses in today in a similar way as we can do it for crystalline materials. And that's the reason why glasses have not yet found a large application in technology. On the other hand, what that indicates is if we would succeed in manipulating the defect structure or the chemical microstructure of glasses, that would own, open up a whole new world of technologies similar to the ones we have today for uh, crystalline materials. And that's the point uh, I want to make for nanoglasses, that that might be a way of doing that. Let me briefly explain what a nanoglass is. As you all know, uh, today, uh, or since the last 80,000 year, 8, years, we're producing glasses by taking a liquid, cool it rapidly, quench it or freeze it at a glass transition temperature, and then the solid, what we get, is called a glass. And now then in the case of nanoglasses, it's a two-step, a different process, a two-step process. What we do, we take the melt and then we break it up in very tiny droplets with the size of a few nanometers and then freeze those droplets to tiny glassy clusters. And these glassy clusters are then taken and they are consolidated. This one is a ferromagnetic property. Uh, here is a normal melt spun glass and here is a nanoglass. The magnetization is about 10 times higher in the nanoglass, although it's the same chemical composition and it's due to those interfaces. Here is the mechanical properties. This is a uh, melt spun ribbon again. It's a brittle glass when you take it and pull it. It, uh, it, 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 it just practices as you know it. When you take a nanoglass, it's a very ductile material and it flows 10, 20 percent. And when you look at the deformed specimen, they have uh, about the size of a structure of a, of a piece of gold or piece of copper. And a, a biologically very uh, attractive feature is the enhanced biocompatibility. Cells grow about a factor 100 times faster on these nanoglasses than on a chemically identical melt spun ribbon. 
And that is attractive, of course, for chemistry. When we coat implants with nanoglasses, they grow in by a factor 100 times faster, which means instead of a month, you can grow them in within a day. Well, what I did so far was I talked about nanoglasses that are made up of clusters, glassy glasses with identical chemistry. But that's not necessarily so. We can also do the same thing, of course, by taking clusters with different chemistry. This is something you could never do with a melt spun glass, which you have today. The nanoglass is no problem. You take clusters of different chemistry and then you mix them together. And that opens up a whole new door as times as the structure goes. Of course you know that when you think about that the glass is structurally a liquid and you know that you cannot dissolve sugar in ice but you can dissolve honey in water. And that's exactly what happens here too. Here is uh, an example uh, for uh, an underglass alloy of uh, components that are immiscible in the crystalline state. What we have used here is an ionic component, it's silicon oxide here in black and a palladium metallic glass in white. We bring them together, then what we see is what we expect. We see the individual clusters, uh, they, and they join together because we have consolidated them. The chemical uh, co composition is also shown here. One, when we scan across it, we see a very high palladium concentration. This is when we hit a, a metallic particle. Then it goes down to zero when we see hit an oxide particle and so on. This is not surprising. But the big surprise came when we looked at this nanoglass at about uh, an annealing of a 250 centigrade. What we see then is that these, all these atoms in the diffuse and we get a solid solution of palladium, silicon, iron and oxygen. So it's a, a solid state mixture of an oxide with a, with, a, with a metal. That means you can alloy now a window glass with a piece of iron. Something which you could never do in a crystalline state. And that, of course, means that we get a material which we couldn't produce uh, so far uh, and they form a new kind of alloy in this glassy state. And this is a fundamental progress. When you look at the Bronze Age, Iron Age, Semiconductor, you're always alloyed metals with a metal, non-metal with a non-metal, but never across. And now with another glass you can do it and that, of course, results in, uh, in new properties. And there is one more thing we can do, and I'll briefly show as time permits. Uh, I will briefly show you that we can also uh, manipulate the electronic structure of these materials. What we do is, we take a, a two-phase nanomaterial, shown here black and white again, and then we remove one component, the black one, and replace that one component by an electrolyte. And then if you apply a voltage, between the electrolyte and this, this residual component, then of course we get a highly charged interface between the electrolyte and the, 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 black, the white component. And as, uh, as about 50% of the atoms are sitting in these interfaces, we can therefore manipulate the electronic structure of this uh, material, the white atoms, uh, between h half or one electron charge. That means we can shift them electronically in the periodic table, one line to the right and one line to the left. And that, of course, changes their properties dramatically. I'll show you three examples. One example is uh, shown on the lower left side here. It's strontium titanate. Strontium titanate in a pure form is an, is an insulator. If we charge it in a way we do it here, then what you can see is it becomes a superconductor. And the critical temperature is about 0.4 because we have extracted so many electrons that the electronic structure has changed and made it a, a superconductor. Another property uh, is shown here on the, on the right side. It's an ito material. Uh, when we charge it, we can change uh, the, 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 the resistivity uh, by about 300%. Uh, on the right side here, uh, uh, things, uh, the magnetic, uh, ma micro uh, magnetic uh, chemistry, ma magnetic moment uh, of a palladium nickel uh, nanoglass in here, you can see by, by applying a, a voltage of a harder volt, you can change the thing by about 45%. And, uh, and, and so let me finally uh, show you after all of this, uh, what are the conceivable developments of this field in the future? You can see that by going back into history. When you look at history, what we see is that 
by applying the, the technological application of crystalline materials, we have to we have developed today's technology. And as I indicated at the very beginning, this applies for metal semiconductors as well as isolators. So, so, and so we are living today in a, in a kind of a, 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 crystal, a crystalline age or crystalline materials period. And this is applies to the Bronze Age, Iron Age, semi all these things. Uh, all is discovered is that we have a new chemical composition, new properties, and then we apply a technology and that leads to a technology, a new technology. Now in the with nanoclasses we have a very similar situation. We have a new material with new properties, and so the hope is by applying nanoglasses technology-wise, we should be able to create a new technology period, not now based on non-crystalline materials as we have it today on crystalline. And that should apply to metal, semiconductors, and ceramic materials, but due to the new properties of these glasses, it would be a whole new world of technologies. That's the good news. Now comes the catch. At the moment, the way we make these nanoglasses it's very expensive, time-consuming, and we cannot make large quantities. As I told you, we break the liquid up and then bring it together, join it, con consolidate it. You can make a gram of that, but you cannot make a ton. And so the, the critical point now is if somebody would come along and find a way to make nanoglasses economically in large quantities, that would open the door uh, to such a new technology age of mankind based on non-crystalline materials in the same way as we have it today. There's no reason why that shouldn't happen, but the bottleneck at the moment is very clearly Nanoglasses are very, very expensive at the moment, but this is all, was always true in the past. When you look at the semiconductor technology, I remember when I was at Bell Labs and shortly was around, they laughed about him when he said, well, we need an impurity level of 10 to the minus 19, and then came the stone refining along and the thing was solved. The same was true for iron. For long periods, iron was a brittle material, and then people learned how to get the carbon out and it became a ductile material. So we are in a similar situation now with these nanoglasses that we can now produce non-crystalline materials with very attractive properties, new fundamentally new properties, atomic structure, electronic structure, but at the moment the bottleneck is the expenses for producing it. If somebody would find a way to produce them, that would open the whole door for a new technology age. And that's the reason I'll show you in a second here, the people that were involved and also for why the Chinese government at the moment is starting up a new whole new institute, just a building about 80 million dollars that to enter into this glass region, this glass period of mankind by bringing very people with very different backgrounds together, to join them and that they would by interacting find ways to produce these things. This, are, this is a long list of the people that have been involved in these studies. The list is so long because it's a very multidisciplinary field. You have many uh, properties, many structures, many chemical compositions. So what we do, if we prepare a new kind of nanoglasses, we approach a group which is an expert in a spectroscopy or in a diffraction technique, and cooperate with them and, and produce the results. So we inherit their expertise, and they inherit from us a new material which seems interesting. And that's the reason why we have people here from Japan, from China, from India, from Europe, from the United States, and they all, they all cooperate on this kind of questions. And here are the, the, the institutes where these things have been done. This is the institute at the upper right side where I started, and uh, in the middle this is the one where I'm at the moment. And this is the first new one in uh, Nanjing, and a very new institute is coming up in Shenyang, the city of the Chinese Academy of Science. And this is a big institute which will be totally devoted to these uh, nano glass. And very last, there is a, a review I've written recently. You can get a feeling of what is going on, but this field changes very rapidly at the moment because quite a few groups enter into the field and use these materials, study them, and try to find out what is going on. The interesting part is that we get by this thing into a new solid state, which we couldn't do before. A density change of 50% is very traumatic. It's about about 20% what you can do from the crystalline state to the critical point. So there's a whole new solid, and you can see it becomes a ferromagnet, and some materials become insulated when you go to nanoclasses and so on. Actually, the word nanoclass is a bit confusing 
because you know, the glass, we use the glass to make the interfaces, and the interfaces are the ones which uh, produce the new material. It's somewhat similar to a polycrystalline or nanocrystalline material where you use the crystals to make the boundaries and the boundaries in a nanocrystalline material uh, uh, generate the new properties. So that is the final uh, result and I'm sure if the talk would be given about five years from now they would be talking about totally different properties. Anyway, that's the state of the art and the perspective which it opens up. Thank you. Some speakers present some the style of it is not so important, but they present some new ideas and some new observations and some do something which, no, there's nothing wrong with it. But they say, well, I, I have, this is known and I improve it a little bit. I feel more attracted to the ones that bring up new ideas. I, I think it's a, good, a very good idea because what I notice now in the United States, for example, for reasons of cost and for reasons of time, they have so, such airport conferences now. What they do is they come in by plane go to the airport hotel, give a talk and fly out again. And so you never see these people who have hardly a chance and there is not this intellectual exchange. Very often new things come out by talking to people that uh, are, have a different background, different views. But if you don't see them and you don't have a chance and the time to talk to them, you could read a, a, a journal or you could do it by internet. There's a difference what Heisenberg says, science comes out of discussions. And science does not come out of papers and, 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 and telephone calls. And so I think people could be first keeping people together and put it in an atmosphere which is a pleasant atmosphere, a relaxing atmosphere. I think the idea with a cruise ship is a very good idea.